These five words can sometimes tell you a lot about people's accents. Cot, cot, cloth, trap, bath. 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 Of course, there are slight differences in pronunciation between the qualities of the vowels. The British accents tend to pronounce the cot vowel with rounded lips, whereas some of the American accents don't, o versus r. In some of the American accents, the trap vowel is pronounced with a slightly higher tongue position, so a relative to a. In the Cockney accent, you have this slight raising diphthong, o. And in fact, you have a very slight diphthong in a couple of the American accents as well, or. A note from the editor. O and or, while then they're often not transcribed as diphthongs in textbooks and things because um, normally for the purposes of a phonological analysis you don't really need to think of them as diphthongs. On a phonetic level they definitely are when they're pronounced carefully. Um, and you can tell this because they're often, in textbooks, they're often both written using the backward C IPA character. But you can very clearly hear that they're two different sounds. O, or, O, or. So this is a, a very good way of getting your ear tuned to the fine, you know, the finer differences between the sort of start and end qualities of uh, narrow diphthongs. But look at the distribution of the vowels across the words. In the first American accent I did, cot, court and cloth have the same vowel as each other, something like ah, and so do trap and bath, something like ah. In the second one, cot and cloth have the same vowel as each other, a low, maybe slightly lip-rounded vowel, ah, oh, but court has a separate vowel that's got a higher tongue position and maybe a bit more lip-rounding, or. Oh. In the third accent, only cot has this lowest vowel, ah, oh, whereas court and cloth have the higher, more lip-rounded vowel, or. Oh. Throughout these American accents, trap and bath have the same quality as each other, even if the acoustic quality of that vowel differs a little bit from one accent to another. The Southern British accents also show differences in distribution. In my accent, cot and cloth have the same vowel, whereas court has a longer vowel with a higher tongue position. And trap and bath have two different vowels, a, r. In the posh rp accent and the cockney accent, the distribution is actually the same. Cot has one vowel, court and cloth both have the same vowel as each other, and trap and bath again have two different vowels. Accents that have a different vowel in lot to cloth are said to have the lot cloth split, and accents that have a different vowel in trap to bath are said to have the trap bath split. These splits are historically related to each other, and I'll outline their history later in the video, but nowadays the trap bath split has survived a lot better than the lot cloth split has. The trap bath split is the norm among southern English accents and also Australian, New Zealand, South African, and Indian English accents. Why are you calling? And then afterwards, then they start asking questions. Everyone was standing together. Everyone's facing the camera while you... Although it's a time of great happiness, that mischievous inquiring twinkle means we can't celebrate. And there was nothing to do your washing with. Pints are that, no half pints. Pints with a shilling on your glass in case you nicked it. Having lived in the north of England, I've had northerners try to approximate a posh southern accent by imitating the long-backed bath vowel. But in the South, this isn't a class indicator at all. People of all social classes do it, and have done it for at least as long as people have been recording audio. The lot cloth split is a lot rarer in the UK. It's known from older Cockney accents and older received pronunciation at both ends of the class spectrum. But bald you could eat all of And there was nothing to do your washing with. Common soda, a bar, and they used to watch anyone put their glass down, go bloody when you look round the next bit was gold. But nowadays, if you hear it at all, you'll hear it in a very residual way. People might have a couple of words in their vocabulary that fall into the split, like pronouncing gone as gone or pronouncing off as off. But for the most part, they'll just use the lot vowel. The Queen shows evidence of the split in orphan. That family is so orphan. But she says lost rather than lost. Hard for those who have lost loved ones. 
What makes the lot cloth split so interesting to me is the fact that despite having one historical origin, and you can skip to the time on screen if you want to get straight to that part, it survives in parts of the US and parts of the UK, but with completely different social connotations in each. In the US it's associated with urban East Coast accents like you'd find in New York or Boston. The politician Bernie Sanders is a good example of somebody with the split. Look, it's a horrible situation, what's gone on in Afghanistan for so long has been on the loss of good paying jobs in the United States. US speakers with the split tend to have a much more complete version of it than UK speakers with it. It's in these US versions of the split that you can see a pattern if you compare them to splitless versions from the UK. This higher OR vowel exists especially often if there's a F, S or TH sound after it, and often if there's a nasal consonant like ng or G. To a historical linguist, this looks very much like a conditioned sound change. People started pronouncing the vowel a little bit differently if it came before certain consonants, and so this sound category ended up splitting in two. The trap bath split seems to have happened along very similar lines. This backed R vowel very often occurs before F, S or TH. As with a lot of problems in the recent history of English sound change, Roger Lass can help us with this. In the early to mid 1600s, shortly after Shakespeare was writing, the English of London shows no evidence of a trap bath split or a lock cloth split. Trap and bath both had the same vowel as each other, which was probably A, ah, slightly higher than my A ah vowel today, but more in line with Cockney traditional RP in American English accents. We suspect this slightly higher vowel because writers from outside Southern England writing about Southern English say that it's somewhere in between the normal European a uh sound and the e eh sound. A ah fits this bill and it's the most common quality in accents that descend from 17th century London English, so that's what we reconstruct. Evidence of the lot vowel is a bit all over the place. An unrounded variant probably existed, something like a. Ah, and a rounded variant may also have existed, maybe depending on the class of the speaker. Lot versus lot. The first step was lengthening of the trap vowel before er. In London, you had cat with a short vowel, but car with a long vowel. And you'll notice this slightly raised front vowel in car is still widespread in Ireland. This lengthening affected all words where the trap vowel was followed by er. And this part of the sound change even spread into the north. Cat, car. Then the trap vowel also lengthens before f, s, or th. Cat, sat, but car, bath, pass, staff. Like a lot of sound changes, this doesn't happen to all possible words at once. Words slowly drop into the change over time if they meet the condition of having this fricative after the vowel. If modern sound changes are anything to go by, the most commonly used words probably adopted the longer vowel earliest. Normally, this kind of sound change would be called allophonic, meaning there are two different pronunciations, but they're hardly different at this point in quality, and a lot of the time you can work out from context which sound will be used. The long a ah before er, s, f, f, and the short a ah everywhere else. But this sound change didn't ever finish. It didn't spread to all possible words meeting the condition. At some point, this ah quality would have lowered to ah. Cat, sat, but far, bath, pass. It's not clear when this lowering happened, but it could easily have happened by 1700. And at this point, because the split was incomplete, there were probably two separate phonemes emerging. You couldn't completely predict from context which sound would be used. Speakers were starting to think of a ah and a ah as two distinct speech sounds. In parallel with this, basically the same thing was happening with the lot vowel. You had a short vowel in cot, lot, but a long vowel in farm, scorn. This change before r probably cemented itself and spread outwards through the country. And then the vowel began to lengthen before f, s, and th as well. Off, cloth, cross. Somewhere along the line, this merged with an already existing long r vowel in all, law. In 1687, Christopher Cooper wrote about the first stage of this diffusion, although obviously he didn't know it was the first stage of a diffusion at the time. He suggests path, 
bar and car had the short vowel, but cast, gasp and barge had the long vowel. Of the lot set, he suggests this vowel had lengthened in lost, off, frost, but not in loss. He comments on some situations where the vowel is generally long versus where it's generally short. Apologies in advance for how much I use Roger Lass in this segment, um, but he's, you know, he provides an extremely in-depth description. Um, but he points to James Mather Flint as a northern English phonetician who describes the lowering of long a ah to a ah by 1740. Um, and it seems as though the lowering was more advanced. It happened earlier in words where a r followed. So, far, car. Um, and it was possibly variable before f, s, and th, so somewhere between bath and bath. And the lengthening hadn't happened at all in the word chaff, an example of a word that escaped this sound change because the pronunciation chaff is still common in the South nowadays. As Lass points out, Flint was a northerner, which means he'd probably grown up in an area where the trap vowel had always been low and possibly central, ah. Uh, so he probably would have had a keen ear to the differences between the lowered ah quality and the ah quality. And I can attest to that sensitivity myself, because even as a child with no knowledge about phonetics, I remember specifically thinking that Americans sounded like they were saying the trap vowel more like eh, which was my kind of rudimentary way of realising that they had a more raised trap vowel than I did. So people with no modern linguistics education can be sensitive to this kind of thing. Throughout the 1700s, different phoneticians give different descriptions of which a ah words have taken the a ah vowel and which a ah words have taken the a ah vowel. All the phoneticians' last lists show exceptions to the rule, the, the rule about coming before f, s, and th. The diffusion of this sound change was still taking place. In John Walker's 1791 pronouncing dictionary, he actually describes some of this irregularity. He says that people, which probably means upper class people, used to say dance glass, but now more often say dance glass. He says that half and calf should have a long a, ah, but that you should say after and plant with a short a. Ah. If you say after and plant, this borders on vulgarity. This reveals a class element to the trap bath split. Last suggests that upper class people in the late 1700s may have been avoiding or backtracking on the trap bath split because saying the long ah sound in the wrong situation sounded too lower class and this is yet another situation where a common misconception is dented. It's sometimes said that modern posh southern British speech was invented in the 1700s to separate the upper classes from the lower classes but in so many situations the sound changes that characterise southern British speech were once perceived as part of a lower class accent before they slowly made their way into upper class speech. Walker explicitly says the exact same thing about the lot cloth split. He says it would be equally exceptionable, equally vulgar, to pronounce moss and frost as if they were spelled moss and frost. The rest is a bit hazy. In the relevant dialects, the bath vowel must have backed from ah to ah. The cloth vowel must have raised from something like ah to or, and you end up with the distribution that you have today. Thank you very much for watching this video and I hope it wasn't too um, slidey rather than, you know, I tried to put a few birds in there. I know some people get annoyed by the birds, but I feel like the birds are nice, so I continue to put them in. Um, but yeah, thank you for watching and I'll talk to you next time.